Hey, what's up? This is John Mana for the Worship Drummer Podcast, and we've got an awesome guest today by the name of Brandon Green. And Brandon is probably better known on YouTube, at least, as his YouTube channel handle Drum Mechanics. And Brandon, this is, you're like a two-peat uh, guest now on the Worship Drummer Podcast. So I just want to say thanks for making some time. I know you're busy and you have a, a wonderful studio behind you. And um, today, firstly, I just want to give you a chance. Hey, welcome again. Joe, John, man, I'm going to say Joe Mana. We're just talking about your name. John, man, well, listen, man, thank you so much for having me, man. Honestly, we had, we had a lot of fun last time and we had some great conversation talking about just getting into the mechanics of drumming. So it's really a pleasure being here and you're just doing great stuff with the platform. I mean, I, in case anyone doesn't know, you just got a really cool little relationship building with Drumio, which I thought was very cool to see you guys have a little partnership there. So congratulations yeah. on that to you. Yes. And by the way, since you mentioned that, Check out the link. Uh, you can get 30 days free of like amazing drumming lessons and from the top of the top of the guys. And um, check it out. And today we have one of the top of the top in the field of I would I don't maybe I'm not giving it justice because um, I, I you know I said I'm not going to pull up your bio again, but um, Brandon Green. Let me just share from my heart for a second. I came across his stuff. I I've had back issues for since 2015 and my chiropractor, I never got like doctor scans done, but he basically said, yeah, it's like a bulging disc. And I've re-aggravated that injury probably four or five times. Um, been uh, yeah, flat on my back on the couch for like two to three weeks at a time. And obviously you're not drumming during that, that time, but I came across your YouTube channel and it was a combination of the expertise, but also like the environment. And I remember there's like a spine, you have like all kinds of things that I would see, whether it's my chiropractor's office or my doctor's office. And I was like, this guy's no joke. He's, he knows what he's talking about. And what stood out to me is, as far as I know, and like I was saying earlier, like I have, I think I have pretty good feelers out there uh, in the drumming world, especially. And there's no one that I've come across that can talk about, you know, our body, the approach that we should have, and our drumming, like bringing all of those together. I've, I haven't found anyone who does it quite like you with your expertise and like in the field that you're in. So, uh, Brandon, today I have a question to start, and then you could take this like as deep dive. You deep dive into it, get all nerdy on us, um, you know, but in a vernacular that we'll still follow and trek with you on. So, as drummers, and I think last time we talked, we we covered this idea like hey some drummers are playing like three four sunday services at their church you know back to back to back and i asked you like hey what would be your advice for that kind of uh you know a, a sunday morning but my question this time is how much of it is the day of meaning oh i should wake up you know do some stretches eat the right food that will you know, have sustained energy throughout the day versus, hey, if you're not practicing or doing some kind of physical preparation during the week or on a regular basis, um, you you still won't be quite ready for that kind of a, a schedule for a Sunday morning. So from your, I, I don't have the answer. So that's why I'm asking you, um, how much of it is the pre- preparation versus the day of preparation, if I could boil that question down. Yeah. So it's a great question. And the great news is, I mean, I'm going to give you a really simple answer and then we'll go a little bit deeper. The answer is going to be both for sure. Okay. And if you look at this across the board, if you're looking at this as drummers, like you're talking about uh, drummers into church service, like you're talking about, uh, you're working about uh, talking about a touring drummer, 
who's got a schedule and they play a you know 90 minute show or a three hour show for some of these pop artists, or you're going to a marathon runner or someone who does a physical activity consistently for a long period of time. There's going to be an element of both. And I'll give you a very quick analogy, which is more on the injury side of things, but I can bring it back. If you think about getting a callus in your hand or wherever, yeah. calluses pop up in one of two ways, right? There is the chronic adaptation where you're doing a thing, you're drumming, you're doing whatever it is. And all of a sudden one day you're like, oh, the skin is harder here. It is denser. What yeah. is this here? Right? And then some people go get them cut off because they go get mani petties or whatever. Or some people just let them grow. And so that is this very slow, very nice progression where that callus builds up to the point that I can play drums for two hours at a time and my skin doesn't tear. Then there's the other side of it where there's an uncontrollable amount of physics in a short duration and I get a blister or there's too much way too fast. I remember the first punk gig I did when I was 13 years old. I was working at McDonald's for like two weeks. I had a great job. McDonald's was like, make extra money. I played this punk show. I played 30 minutes. It wasn't even a long set. And I went to McDonald's the next day for my job. And I had 13 blisters on my hands. And it was because I was sweaty, hot, and adrenaline. And I was just squeezing the stick so hard. And I was 13. And it just wasn't good. <laughs> That's because there was too much stress too quickly. So if we extrapolate this kind of like simple idea that there are going to be long-term adaptations and short-term adaptations that all make this work. If we reverse engineer this, we can actually make this pretty mechanical. So if we go, um, you are doing, let's say you have five hours of service that you're doing on Sunday and that's broke up into five hour services with maybe a half hour break in between. Is that fair? Something sure. like that? Yeah. Sure. So you got five hours of work that you're going to do and you got 30 minute breaks in between. The first, you, you, no matter what, if you want to make sure you're completely prepared for this, you have to actually practice doing things like that. So I've never done that much drumming uh, for that long time. So if I was going to start doing that, I play for an hour pretty readily and consistently. So the next thing I would do is, okay, I need to schedule every week a day that is consistently devoted to endurance. And it could be as simple on the drum kit, just practicing for an hour an hour and 15, an hour and 30, and an hour and 45, and work my way up to the five hours playing similar intensity music and genre. And that's just simply micro progression, adding 25, that's not even micro, it's pretty big, 25% jumps, it starts to get smaller as you get to longer periods of time. So there's that. Then the other side of it is if you know in the hour you're going to be playing X number of songs, let's call it Let's call it 12 songs, right? You know, you're yeah. going to be playing 12 songs that are three minutes long. Well, maybe you don't have access to a drum kit. So one thing that you could do is if you have a gym or you're at home and you have some sort of exercise you can do, a skip rope, stairmaster, squats, whatever it may be, you could strategically design a conditioning program. And truthfully, the type of exercise won't matter as much as the heart rate adaptation where you go, I'm going to do 12 sets that are three minutes long each with a minute break in between, and I'm just going to keep going, keep going. And this starts to act, work on your actual energy system. So your aerobic and anaerobic capacity get conditioned to dealing with that particular level of tolerance. And this is just like what marathon runners do, right? They, they've got to run a specific distance. I want to run a 10K. Well, they run a K and a K and a K, and then they run a K and a half, a K and a half, and they start blurring the lines together. So if you really want to get through a five-hour service, if you're not conditioned for it, the most strategic thing you can do is devoting some time per week towards building up your ability to tolerate that. The unique thing that also pops up with that, though, is that you literally have to have five hours of endurance of hands and five hours of endurance of potentially right foot or left foot or whatever you're playing. They're probably not playing double bass in worship, but you know what I mean? We have seen it though. I'm sure you guys have. I'm sure you have. And he's not there anymore. <laughs> so this is where, I mean, of course, if you can do practice pad work or anything that involves a stick being in your hand for that duration, the physical tolerances of your muscles and your skin will increase. But very simply, you have to practice to build up your body. Now, let's say you have done all that legwork and you've developed your body and it is as perfect as possible. Yeah. You have kids I have kids. You and I both know if you don't sleep the night before, it doesn't matter how amazingly perfect you are at everything. You're going to be screwed to some degree because sleep <laughs> deprivation is a thing. So you have these chronic adaptations like the callus that are just always, not always there, but they're readily available. And then the one night before, you're sleep deprived. You didn't eat enough. You're taking, you got a cold. And all of these acute short-term stressors absolutely influence where you're at. So you need this long-term preparation of 
not long term, but a strategic plan to build up the substrates or the, uh, the substrates you said vernacular, right? The foundation, if you will, or right? you need the solid foundation to make sure that you can do the things that you want to do for the time. And then on the day, you need to make sure you're fueling yourself, which is really simple. So when I talked to you before about electrolytes and almonds, to be quite honest, I actually think that I would offer something different. So if you're doing this five hours, hour, 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 you're going to need, if it's moderately intense, some glucose, some yeah. level of sugar. And it depends on what it is. I don't mean candy, but I mean, you can get 30 grams of carbohydrates in a small amount of rice. Um, honestly, I have like unpasteurized honey, which is just delicious. And I'll have like a tablespoon of that when I finish some exercises because it's all natural. And unfortunately, you need to experiment to see what works well for you because some people will have rice and they'll get foggy and tired. Well, they'll eat a piece of bread and get energized and vice versa. Mm. But it, the thing is, is if you're depleting your muscular energy storages, glucose is a very powerful. Hydration is very important. Glucose is an important uh, component of that. Uh, healthy fats is really important for cognitive function. Um, I wouldn't skip out on strategic doses of caffeine per se to make sure that my mental acuity is prepared for that particular event. But there's no way around it you know, you could be the most energetic, perfect person in the world, but you can't handle five hours of drumming. If you haven't done it ever before, you're going to get injured. You could be someone who can handle five hours of drumming, but if you are not prepared on that day, you have fasted the day before and you're on medicine and you had a surgery the day before, your ability will be modified temporarily for that day. So there's no way around it. You need to do both. Uh, the great news is the options to do both of which are unlimited, it really just makes sure that you're doing something that helps you get up to there. There are strategic ways to do it faster, but for most, you just need to prepare. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. And like you alluded to, life happens and you know we have kids, we get busy, we work a full-time job, you know, and then Sundays is just us serving our church. What you know, so I say that to say, my guess is most people probably would not do what you're suggesting. No. So what are some of the things that you've seen? Uh, maybe it's injuries or maybe it's like when we're negligent in taking our health seriously or the preparation part seriously. Oh boy, man. I mean, I hate to say this. I think every drummer in the world who's been playing for 10 years could actually answer this question because it's so common. You hear the same things over and over again. Um, your hands, I mean, the number of carpal tunnel injuries or ulnar compressions or uh, hurting thumbs that I've read about. I mean, even I won't say who, but one of my friends, I got a friend who's someone who's a famous YouTube drummer, which is cool. Two of them, actually similar problems. And both of them, very popular guys. Both of them were trying some different techniques out. One was working on traditional technique. One was working on a new blast beat style technique. Both got thumb injuries in the process. Mm -hmm. They are both very well conditioned, play a lot, but they were trying something different. And even though they drum for hours at a time, the 20 minutes they did with the new technique that involved news muscles was just outside of what they could tolerate. So they got strained there and they were out for like two or three weeks from doing that. Wow. So hands is a real thing, right? Um, absolutely. The thing that I have talked to the most professional drummers about, which I find interesting, is back injuries. And it's just at the end of the day, sitting inherently is not a wonderful thing for our body. And if we are sitting in a way, both depth, position, uh, our actual specific techniques, it can really cause some big back problems. And I mean, anyone that's got a parent that's in the traveling stage of their life and they're retired, I'm sure you've heard them. They go on a plane somewhere, they drive a long <laughs> distance, and they're back sore. And yeah. there's a reason why that happens. And it just has to do with being in the seated position and having something called the lumbo pelvic rhythm forcing you into a particular position over time does create stress on your back. And so we have to be really strategic with this and try to be unbiased to assess what we can do. But that's the one thing, I mean... Guys that you and I both know in the industry, the number of back injuries I've heard about is is bonkers. And most um, one of which, who's one of the most popular, won't even talk about it because he's fearful if he talks about it, the perception of him looking less healthy that might hinder his ability to get gigs. Right. So there's this real silence in the industry of drummers who are super cats who won't talk about what they're actually feeling for the fear of just getting replaced. That's crazy. So... If sitting is not the ideal posture for us, um, are there any tips then that you can give us? I, I, not everyone is playing five hours on a Sunday, but I mean, even if you're just doing two services, you're still there for rehearsal. 
it can almost be three hours. That's that's a good amount of time sitting and you know giving it all you've got. So what are some tips maybe that you can give us if we're going to be sitting at the kit going, you know, digging our heels in, so to speak? Well, I mean, you need you need to make sure that you're sitting on the right thing. Like there's this interesting relationship between the human anatomy and your specific geometry and the geometry of the thing that I'm sitting on, right? Like everyone everyone can pretty much visualize what two glutes look like because most people have pretty, pretty similar looking butt anatomy, but it varies from person to person, the size, the width, how much muscle versus fat there is, the shape of the bone. So we have this geometry down there. And then the next thing is the thing that we're sitting on. And there are a lot of companies that will try to create unique shaped thrones that have concave and convex areas that are trying to accommodate the drummer's position. Yeah. And the challenge is like, if you were to go buy an orthotic and they said, this is the orthotic that fixes arch problems, right? If you went to a Sharabidist, you know that if there are, you and I got the same orthotic, if we even needed that, it would be, our feet are different shape. Yeah. Your big toe might be longer than mine. My arch might be flatter than yours. So how could it possibly be that one convex shape thing is going to be able to be a panacea fierce? And that's why they have custom orthotics. Well, when you have all these companies that are releasing thrones with slits in them to try and accommodate back problems, uh, with my, in my opinion, uh, tractor thrones, I mean, the variety of different shapes that are there, there are a ton of them. Some of them have very, some of them are very comfortable. I've got the DW5000 uh, that I play around with. I don't recommend playing on it if you're playing intricate footwork, but it's a very comfortable thing to sit on. But if I sit on some of the other ones that have, uh, my friend's got the Mapex one. It has very different uh, leg saddles, concave areas. So when you have your anatomy integrating with geometry, you have to recognize that the, the geometry of the other stuff, like the throne, is going to push you into positions and can cause some problems. So my general recommendation, if anyone wants like a quick sound bite that dives deeper into my nerdy, I would recommend someone just gets a really sturdy, flat drum throne. Something with no shock absorbers, something that doesn't have any move into it, something that is locked, something that is flat, moderately firm upholstery, because you don't want any concavedness or material pushing you. And this is a big problem. Like one of my clients, who's a client at my gym, he has one of these beautiful $120,000, 1500 uh, Denali Sierra trucks. And He's a very healthy fit guy, but they made these bucket seats mm. and even he has no problems except his hips are killing him getting in and out of the car at certain times because if he doesn't sit in the right spot, the actual bucket seat of the chair is pushing into him. And this is a $120,000 truck with tons of engineers at the helm. There's not that kind of money in the drum world. So there's that. The other thing that I would say that is most important, like there's just so much with the drum sitting conversation is that drummers need to be sitting with their bum, their full weight in the middle of the drum throne. I don't know if we talked about this last time, but if you sit on the edge of your drum throne, a couple things happen. One, your legs, as you can imagine, if I chopped each one of my leg off, my leg itself has an amount of weight to it, yeah. which makes sense. And if my leg weighs, let's call it 35 pounds for whatever reason, probably more than that. But let's say my leg weighs 35 pounds. Every time I play the bass drum stroke, if my leg were not attached to my torso, I have to deal with that 35 pounds to some degree. Now, someone would argue that you're just dropping your leg down to use that 35 pounds to do the bass drum sound. Sure, but it's got to get up somehow. Yeah. And it's either coming from the foot or it's coming from your hip flexor. So it could be hip flexor abdominal layer. So it's one of those two things. So if you sit on the front of your drum throne, there is more of the mass of your leg in front of the drum throne. So it means, well, I'll get the, so there's more of your leg in front of the throne and your foot is actually further away from your point of application on the throne. So yeah. I've done this experiment on social media and maybe you've seen it, but if not, I take two analog scales and I put them down on the ground and I do this in every time I talk about this. And when I sit with my bum in the middle of the drum throne, at my current, I'm 185 pounds as I am today. My feet, when I'm sitting in the middle of my drum throne, each scale says 17 pounds. When I move my bum to the edge of the drum throne, they go mm. up to 35. Wow. That's a staggering difference. So let's talk about your five hour drummer again. And they're paying, let's just say they're playing four in the floor for five hours. Yeah. I'm going to be honest, that difference between, you know, 17 to 35, like that double difference pretty much. That's a staggering difference. And that like might not seem like a lot at the very beginning, but I'll tell you what, I'd rather pick up 17 pounds for five hours than I'd rather pick up 35 pounds. And so you start to get people who get more hip fatigue, 
more foot fatigue. Now, that's one problem, right? There's an increase in resistance to all the stuff that does bass drum, lower leg stuff. Heel down, it's a little less bad, but it is still a factor. Anything heel up. The second part is since you've shifted so much of your center of mass to the front, if you try, like if I've got 35 and 35, 70 pounds, right? So I'm 185 pounds, 115 pounds of me are on the throne. No, I'm doing this wrong. Uh, 70, so yeah, 115 yeah. pounds sitting through the throne. And I got 70 pounds through my feet in front, right? So if you try to lift your feet off the ground, like I'm sitting on the edge of my stool right now. If I try to lift my feet off the ground, I'm going to fall forward because too much of me is in front, right? Teeter-totter mechanics 101. Yeah. It's like 40, 60. Or I have to lean back to accommodate this. So when you see someone sitting on the edge of their drum throne and they're playing double bass, or they're keeping time on their hi-hat that's kind of like quarters or eighth notes, and they're trying to do syncopated bass drum stuff, you see them leaning back to do this. And it's not because they have bad technique. It's they're not positioned in a way that they have enough stability to even do the thing that they want to do. Yeah. So that's a big problem because many of the other people in this ecosystem drumming that try to talk about uh, posture and having a healthy back, they're talking about reducing the load on your back, which is a very important thing. You actually increase the load in your back when you go back into spinal extension, because what ends up happening is you have you have your, your vertebral body, and then at the back you've got these little door hinges that are called articular facets. And when I'm sitting here, like I can even show you as I sit here. If you watch, please watch the video. If you listen to this podcast, go to YouTube and watch this. It's an incredible YouTube channel with incredible stuff. And by the way, Drumio, click the link below. But <laughs> so if you're sitting, right? If I'm sitting as I am and I'm sitting neutral, and I turn to the left and I turn to the right. You can see I've got an amount of motion, whatever that means. Yeah. If I just arc my lower back, so I just push my hips forward, arc my lower back, and I do the same thing, the amount of motion I have available decreases dramatically. And that's because little bones in my back, articular facets, actually lock up, and I lose the ability to produce range of motion. This happens in the extended position. So this means, this is also the reason why so many drummers lean forward, because you actually have more mobility leaning forward, but that's another conversation. <laughs> so... The problem is, is that when you're sitting for a long period of time, you need to make sure, one, you're sitting in a position where your hips actually have range of motion available. Two, you have the least amount of resistance that you're dealing with when you perform any of these strokes because it's going to let you do all the things you want to do with your feet better. Yeah. And you also want to make sure that you're not forcing yourself, compromising your position to try and allow this to happen. And when you go back into spinal extension, all of the things that we want to try to avoid go up. It's a higher likelihood you're going to get injured when you're leaning back. Wow. And there's a bunch of other stuff here. Like there's just more to unpack. But this is really like the real goal is to reduce the number of variables that stop us from wanting to do what we want to do. Right? I'm on a double bass kick right now. I'm trying to explore a bunch of syncopated stuff and foot ostinato stuff because I'm trying to like push my body as much as I can because of what I'm doing. And I'll tell you like every time I experiment with moving my foot, my bum forward on my drum throne, or I sit in a tractor throne that does the same thing and tips me forward, I cannot I cannot play any mid-range stuff that involves my feet to work and uh, and suspend myself in the air. It's just right. not it's not possible. So anyway, dude, there's just so much more to talk about there, but that's just kind of like getting into the, the the front. The other thing too, actually, like a really important one is something called active range of motion. And I talk about this in my course that we can talk a little more about if you want. Yeah. But when you do, when I move my arm in space, like if I come out to this, do this one, if I raise my arm up, up to beside my ear and I come back down, my ability to reach my arm up to this position, whatever you want to call that, and come back down is a combination of what my structure allows me and what my muscles can do right now. And we all know if your muscles are tired, this is a really extreme example. You can't move the same distance because your muscles are fatigued and you lose range of motion. This happens in the gym all the time. I'm doing a curl. I can't get as high. So this is where when you're sitting, you need to make sure that you have extra active range of motion in your hips because if I'm sitting so low that I can't lift my hip off the ground, mm, yeah. as I fatigue, my ability to lift my leg up will decrease more, which means I have to find that motion somewhere. And this is where you see guys who are playing and they're doing bass drum strokes and then they start moving their back doo -doo, doo -doo, because they're trying to find the motion at another joint system because their hip has run out of motion. And the lumbar mm. spine sacral complex, the coxal femoral joint goes from that all the way to the SI joint to the lumbar spine. That's the next thing. And I hate to say it, you talked about your herniated disc. I guarantee no matter what you were doing, that's what happened. Because I have a herniated disc too. And mine's from powerlifting. 
like a monkey when I was young, but it's because this is where a lot of people get hurt when they deadlift and squat and do other traditional exercises. Their hips start to run out of motion. They start to get tired. They modify their position. Yeah. There's a compensatory motion that happens in the low back. Some tissue takes some force and they can tolerate it. Some tissue takes its force, force and cannot tolerate it. And then they get an injury. Wow. <laughs> that, um, it, it's, the info is crazy. Um, Another question, as you were talking on Instagram, and not so much on YouTube, but for sure on Instagram, I've seen some drummers, again, in the worship space, um, you know, we're passionate about the music and about Jesus and all of that. And I've seen a lot of the, like with the hydraulic seat going up and down, just as you're like really getting into it. And they're almost, you know, in this up and down motion. Is that a bad thing? Uh, you just talked about drum thrones and our posture on the seat. What would you say to someone if you saw that video? I don't recommend those at all. I think that the risks outweigh the benefit. And I think it also decreases performance in a Coles notes. So let me try mm -hmm. and justify that. So first and foremost, I was a mountain biker as a kid. I grew up in a small town and all I did was ride bikes. And I remember I had a hard tail. So my front suspension on the front, but nothing in the back. And I could do like all sorts of fun tricks. I love doing jumps and stuff like that. And I remember my buddy, his parents, you know, rich farm kid, got him this $2,000 uh, full suspension bike. Right? It was like the cat's meow. It was the full suspension bike with the shock in the back and the shop in the front. And he tried to do the jump that we were all doing and he didn't go as high. Like he went, Bleh. you could see he hit the jump and he absorbed all that force and went up and then only went like a couple feet and then cra crashed down. And then so he tried to actually just uh, lift, jump up and lift his bike up into the air. And as soon as he pushed down to pick the bike up, the suspension did exactly what it does. It absorbed all the kinetic energy. So there wasn't anything left over to create potential energy the other way. And he tried to pick it up and the bike was too heavy and the suspension, sorry, the rigidness of the bike, there was no energy transfer from the ground. It all got dissipated by the shock. So one, shock absorbers actually do what people think they do. They do dissipate kinetic energy. They help to dissipate it in the form of heat and a few other uh, few other energy sources. It is fantastic and is very, very useful. The challenges you regarded is if we go back to the idea of trying to reduce load through the spine. If I'm sitting as I am here and I have 115 pounds, as I said before, of my torso weight sitting in my chair and I come up and down and I come back down quickly, yes, I do receive uh, an amount of kinetic energy that's probably closer to 200 pounds for a quick instance by the way, the spine is designed to tolerate forces in that way, and that's okay. Yeah. But you do a lot of it, it can be a problem, especially for you and I with herniated discs. So someone who's a compromised back is, ba compromised back is at a much higher risk than someone who doesn't. The challenge is, though, is when you have the shock absorber, as you regarded, this is the first problem in my opinion, is that once they hit the shock absorber, there is this recoil that occurs in which they receive more force for longer duration. So for me, I sit here and I do a bounce, right? I see that receive, I go from 210, let's call it double, I get 220 pounds of force for a split second, and then it's gone. Yeah. I can deadlift double that, so I'm not worried about dealing with that kind of force in this situation. And I think that's where we should all be thinking about things anyway. But if you are concerned about that, the thought process doesn't work because when you absorb the force and it keeps bouncing and bouncing and bouncing, depending on the amount of bounces from the single stroke, you receive increased doses for longer duration. So it goes 220, probably not 220 because it absorbs some, it goes 200, 160, 120, 100, 100. 100. And it's like this undulating thing. So you actually receive way more net stress over time. Right? Mm -hmm. If you take the net stress, you would times each interval of stress and you'd add that. That's way more than 220 once. It turns into 1,000 pounds of force as opposed to one. Yeah. So that is one problem. And this is where for me, I would not do that. The second is in performance world, like if you think about performing, swinging a golf club, uh, you know, play, hitting a, a hockey puck, stability in your base is absolutely critical. Yeah. I mean, if you take a golfer and you have him swing a golf club on a carpet with socks on versus shoes, watching how much they cannot swing the club because their socks slide on the ground is crazy. And that's from a loss of stability and an inability to transfer that kinetic energy from the thing they've got to their feet to come back into the thing. So when you have that shock absorber, you now, and this is not just shock absorber, but it's also uh, similar to when a throne can spin. Hmm. So I decide... When you're, if I'm playing a bass drum stroke and there is any motion 
that occurs at the throne, it is some kinetic energy being transferred to the throne and not to the bass drum pedal. So, or hi hat or whatever it may be. So, if I'm starting to bounce my foot up and down and I'm start bouncing, now I have this. I mean, dude, you want to be like a little silly for a second. If you think about group exercise classes, so I've been in the gym space for 20 years and everyone sitting on a BOSU ball was a thing for years. Yes. And I remember there was like the, like people would be sitting to work on their core while they're working on their computer and stuff like that. Yeah. Trying to do anything skillful while you're bouncing on a ball would not work to the same degree because you're literally bouncing on a ball and you have two things going on concurrently. Well, it's the same thing with drumming, right? If I have a throne that can spin, Right. If I'm trying to, like a perfect example, one of the things I love to do, and I teach my students this to build their strength and work on mobility, is literally trying to do groups of three from one floor tom to an auxiliary snare or another floor tom. So like one, two, three, one, two, three. Right. For your Thomas Lang, Virgil Donati esque, yeah. great exercise. If you ever do that on a throne that spins or shock absorbs, your stability or inability is exposed mm. because you're because if I go one, two, three, and I throw my arms over and the chair moves and I got to go back and forth with the chair, I'm exaggerating a lot for yeah, the sake yeah. of demonstrative purposes. It's dissipating energy. And so it, you're, it's a really great question. I would say if someone is struggling with back pain and you've been using it for a long period of time and it has been, you feel good doing it, don't change it because of my position. In my opinion, I think it is a waste of energy. It is creating more stress on the body in multiple areas, and the net loss will be higher than benefit for those things. And I'm sure by you asking the question, the way you positioned it, you're probably observing something similar. Yeah. Yeah. So that's an in-depth answer. That's really cool. Um, and just for everyone listening, I told you that, that Brandon is the pro. He knows what he's talking about. And you could tell, like, it's not just, well, I've, I've read this, you know, about this and here's what you should do, but it, it's from, this is your livelihood. This is your expertise um, coming out. So you mentioned the, the course and like in the same way you're talking now, is this how your course is built? Like you teaching and instructing. So yeah, just, I'm really curious to hear more about it. I, I remember last time you mentioned that you were hard at work preparing this throughout the summer months, I believe it was. And so, yeah, like share with us, because I, I do believe um, what I would love to see is healthy, healthy drummers in church. A lot of my friends are touring. Let me just give you one more little thing. Um, last Friday in Whitby, since you're a local, I can talk about Ontario. Um, there was a team that came from, well, they're called Bethel Music from Redding, California, and they packed out the place. It was a three hour concert with about a 20 minute break in the middle for the band. And um, I just at the end of all of that, my my friend Dan was the drummer. He's like, now we got to go tear down and pack everything up. So they didn't have like roadies or things like that to help um, for the most part. So a lot of guys do get tired and obviously living on the road, touring a lot takes a toll. So health is such a big deal. So I'd, saying all that to say like, I think what you're doing is important. And if there's a course that can you know, we can take with us on the road or to our local church. I'd love for our, our worship drummer family to hear about it. Yeah, thank you so much. And I appreciate it. So it has been, I mean, I would say it's 10 years of work. I mean, since I wrote for Modern Drummer to now. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that I did it right. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm releasing, the course, there's actually two things. But the most important thing I'm releasing is the drum set, the drum set ergonomics blueprint. And I'm really excited about it because everything I'm explaining to you, we go in depth into the course. I just finished the last course. I just loaded the last one up before I talked to you today. Nice. Uh, there was four hours of material on there. And the goal of the course really for the first three and a half hours is to build an entire drum set based off of your individual anatomy, going over the assessments you need to do to figure out what you need to do. And I try in every scenario I can to be demonstrative with experiments. I go through the the scale example that I talked about with you, we go through everything. So basically, we start with just a drum throne. 
and we do the assessments to figure out where you need to sit. Then we add the pedals, and then we add a snare drum. And we consider the snare width, and then we think about the snare height and where your elbow should be and how you should be striking the drum. Then from there, we move towards the other floor instruments like the floor toms. Do you have one, two, or three? Do you even have another one on the side? And right. what makes sense about that? Ultimately, I'm, it goes through everything from posture to technique, rack toms. I try to talk about everything. And I'll be quite honest, the course is created such that that whomever invests into it, if I have new information to add to it, I will add it to it and there will be no additional cost. There's not going to be an ergonomics course too because I think that's crazy. As I learn more information, I want to make sure people have access to it. It is everything that involves the drum set. I actually got to be honest with you. I was not going to incorporate a technique conversation. Yeah. But after talking to tons of professionals, I am not the technique guy, but I've spent a lot of time studying technique and applying my mechanics so we talk about that too, which I'm really excited about. Very cool. At the end of the day, what I'm trying to do with this course is not just sell an ergonomics course, but really change the philosophy of how people are thinking about the drums. Because if you notice, right, you've got the Phil Collins who was forced to stop drumming because of back problems and hit a really crazy drum set. And then yeah. you got guys like Roy Haynes who's able to play smooth and he's still going at 95 nearly 100 years old what's the difference and the more i talk to drummers there are more and more drummers that just have those little aches and pains and those subtle discomforts that they're just getting used to just going with one getting older and yeah. they just deal with them and they deal with them and that's a problem we shouldn't just be pushing through small discomforts because my literal professional business is consulting for people at their 70 80 year olds ages who have tried everything and i'm their last resort because they ignored the pains and other people ignored their pains. We can't. And then the other side of it is that if you look at traditional drum sets, drum sets often look the same, right? It's always kind of the same four piece, the same five piece. You buy a pearl form drum set. It is the same packaging. We have this kind of forced geometry for the last hundred years of the instrument. And that's okay. Even in my course, I go through kind of like the basics because I'm not going to like try and Mike Mangini a drum set to make it make yeah. sense. But what it comes down to is the ability to modify the drum set for your anatomy. And if you understand where you have pains and problems and how their, someone's hurt wrist might move different than ours, you can do things differently. The big one rule that I'm happy to share, it's not a secret, I've talked about on things before, is this very simple thing I call the 80-20 principle, 80-20 rule. And it's the idea that depending on your gig, you should customize your drum setup and the position of primary instruments based off of your motion and where there's the least resistance. If I put my arm, like for example, I put my arms at the side of my body and I externally rotate my arms as far as I can. My arms can get out to uh, being at 180 degrees or 90 degrees on each side. But I don't know if you've ever done this, but I get tension across the front of my shoulders. Right. And there's some like, I don't know if that's end range muscles. I don't know if that's arteries. I don't know if that's veins. But what I do know is if I come into about here, which is called 45 degrees, I feel nothing. So why don't I set all my instruments up in this window where I feel absolutely no sensation? So let's say I'm a metal drummer and I'm playing my china. I'm going to put my china like right here. I'm not playing the ride cymbal so much, so I'll put the ride over a little bit away. So I still have this motion available. And so the 80-20 rule is you want to set up 80% of your playing stuff, the stuff you play 80% mm. of the time in the window where you have zero discomfort and full motion. And then if you're going to hit that china once in a while, have a rocket, Tom, go for it. You can put it at the extremes because even though I feel tension here, I still have ownership over it. It's just not as great of a foundation as it is in this middle area. And so all of this helps us take the information you and I have been alluding to and ultimately allow drummers to perform pain-free. My goal is that drummers do not get hurt by playing the instrument. And I really believe if they understand more of the physics of this, and a little bit about their technique and how they're using their body, they can perform pain-free for their entire life. That's so cool. Um, my hunch is that if I were to come and see you in Newmarket, uh, pay you for one-on-one, -on -one, it, it's probably way out of my budget, but buying this course, giving me access to your knowledge and expertise, is probably more affordable. And by the way, I'm, I'm not being paid to say it like this. I'm just like thinking out loud. So what um, are you able to, t like is the pricing out there? Or? Be, I'm going to be quite honest. I'm working with someone and we're going to try and figure out pricing to make it as affordable as possible. Yeah. I will say two things. Depending yeah. on when this is released, 
competing products. There, we are going to be the least expensive person on the market doing this kind of thing. It will absolutely be affordable. Second, if we get this out before Black Friday, we're going to have a really awesome sale to really make sure that this is out. So I'm hoping people hear this before Black Friday in 2024. And if anyone wants to check out, I mean, honestly, if anyone hears me talking about this in the future, I have a free tester drum set ergonomics course that people can check out. It's a 20 minute video that helps build basically foundation and introduce some of these key concepts that we've talked about. So if anyone wants to message me on Instagram or any of my platforms saying I want that free ergonomics course or just go to drummechanics.com, it's going to be there too. And you'll get access. You just got to join the mailing list and we'll send it over right away and you'll get all sorts of goodies, all sorts of goodies. I mean, at the end of the day, as much as I'm trying to sell a course because I've got a lot of information to share and it makes sense to package it as such, I don't think a lot of this information should cost an arm and a leg. And that's where a big part of my actual social media presence is giving as much information as I can because I want to edify people so much. So uh, the price is still a little secret, but I promise not outrageous at all. And it'll be cheaper on Black Friday. And if you're opposed to both the spending money, for whatever reason, there's a free course that people can check out to kind of, uh, they can test me to make sure that I actually know what I'm talking about and it's worth the money. Oh, that's, and like, what you just said that's exactly why you're even on this podcast because i found your youtube videos probably three years ago and i was like who is this guy and then i'm like he's from ontario i was like we got to get him on and um yeah i think the course is going to be revolutionary and i'm hoping it will be for the drummers that and whoever will uh take it to heart and thank you for giving us access to yourself for like through the course at a fraction of the price of you know and there's only so much one-on-one you can also do um so i think it's a really cool opportunity and uh as we wrap up i know you mentioned the website is there what's your instagram handle that we can follow you and wherever else we can find you I'm drum mechanics everywhere. You go to Instagram, drum mechanics, YouTube. I think it's Brandon drum mechanics. Drummechanics.com is the website. It's going through a slight revamp. So if you have some tech difficulties, it'll be fine in a week or so. Um, but there's one thing I actually forgot that I'll just kind of throw out there for anybody yeah. that's keen. Anyone that one thing that I'm really, really passionate about with all of this is making sure, listen, I, in my day to day career, I mean, I've been flown to to Europe and across Canada to teach exercise science to trainers. And I'm sought out by clients where I have clients that travel far away to come see me. It's not accessible for any drummer unless they're some superstar to afford me and see me regularly right. because of just the busyness and the things I'm juggling. So one thing that I am doing is I'm starting something called the Drum Forever Fitness Program. And what I'm trying to do for a super low cost per month is create an accountability program for drummers on the website where every single month I will provide drum fitness centric workouts that will help drummers get stronger, improve their body and reinforce this idea of having pain free playing ergonomics gets into the geometry of the stuff that's being pushed into us, but then we also need to develop our bodies. And this is great because it helps us to make sure we have the endurance for playing, like I alluded to you, but it also helps to develop our bodies so we can actually just have stronger backs and stronger tissue to have the longevity to play really forever. And so why I bring this up is because obviously it sounds like I'm talking about two things, but anybody who gets into the actual ergonomics course, we're going to provide a couple months for free in the drum forever fitness community. So you can come in, you can check it out. You can talk to me. There's ask me anything. There's going to be incredible guest instructors of all my friends across the world in the fitness industry. So we're going to really inundate this thing with as much as possible with the one key goal of helping drummers play forever. And the nice thing about this is if someone's already doing bodybuilding fitness, they can do this because this is stuff that's actually supporting drumming muscles, so to speak. If it's someone who's never exercised before, we offer an an exertion scale where people can figure out, okay, you know what? I'm only going to go to 25% effort and just stimulate my body lightly. It'll be better than nothing. And if anyone's struggling through the exercises, they'll have access to me in the community and ask me personalized questions, which I'll answer every month. So sweet. Honestly, man, I'm just trying to do everything I can to help drummers play forever. I keep saying that is a cheesy sound bite, but the truth is stronger drummers play longer and pay free, pain-free performance is where it's at. Beautiful. Brandon, thanks so much, man, for your time.